<coughs> Thanks very much, Berserker. Um, so I'm just going to report on some stuff we've been doing um, <coughs> in Austria recently with a, <coughs> a number of partners. Um, so I'd like to actually name those. Um, in a sense, I'm the I'm one of the coordinators, but we have a number of inter interlinked projects. But Cyril Dworsky from UNESCO, Jean Nicolas Haas from the Institute of Botany in Innsbruck, Julia Klammer, Kirsten Kovarek um, on my uh, Bella V project, um, Jutulesko, uh, Jakob Maurer, my PhD student, Henrik Pohl, UNESCO, Marie Claire Rees is one of my, and uh, Helena Seidel de Fonseca, who are a couple of my master's students. And um, we've been uh, uh, reacting, or I've been reacting to the idea that um, uh, the um, lake villages which are contemporaneous with with um, with um, the 37th century uh, BC, or should be roughly somewhere there um, in Austria. The, Mon the so-called Monse culture is very little known, and um, in uh, Germany and uh, Switzerland, there's been a continuous research tradition uh, in Switzerland going back to the end of the 19th century, looking at this stuff. And um, it's all around the Alps now. These things have UNESCO World Heritage status since. Um, uh, 2011 and Austria really is playing a bit of catch up so um, we've been doing a number of things we've got a, a, a program of uh, dry land excavation we've got a program of underwater excavation um, I'm largely going to report on this DAC Beyond Lake Villages of Bella V project uh, uh, today um, which is done in collaboration with um, colleagues in the University of Bern and in the Institute in Hemmenhofen. So it's a German-Swiss-Austrian partnership and that allows us to look at landscape across a number of scales from the site through to the locality, to the region, to the inter-region um, and uh, ultimately the whole North Alpine area and um, it's interlinked with a, an underwater prospection project and various other um, uh, aspects of uh, public outreach. So um, generally the uh, idea that's been quite strong in Switzerland has been of a, uh, of, um, a, a low anthropogenic in, impact um, in the Monse period with short-lived, low population density, locally resourced villages literally that are uh, with a sort of a, a wildwood behind them or not really very much going on, um, not all that much um, uh, copper utilisation and a relatively egalitarian uh, social structure accounting for the rather thinly spread data with one or two kind of well-preserved hotspots. And that goes back to the 19th century Pahlbau romantic, the lake village uh, romantic view of people sort of uh, living in healthy proximity to the water and most of the material was excavated at the end of the 19th century. This is the interior of Monse Museum. It is the period of the first copper, of which then largely drops out of use. It comes in, comes in, in large uh, objects that may be imported, um, and that in um, towards the end of the uh, Middle Neolithic, then we have the Copper Age, the later Neolithic Copper Age, and then we have the final Neolithic, which becomes very, very stony again before the beginning of the Bronze Age. And there's a big debate about how much of that was going on. Um, the alternate view which I'm articulating or trying to in a sense test against the data is a maximal anthropogenic concept where we might envision very high population or high population densities with a lot of specialization with hierarchical groups interregionally resourced trade and exchange a lot of competition uh, especially uh, for flints and for salt and for copper and for timber and for charcoal and for non-subsistence products and that, in a sense, could also explain the low level of site visibility due to destruction and erosion, but it's, a, it's an argument, if you like, ex silencio, or, um, uh, you know, it, it, it um, could be. Um, so anyway, we're beginning to catalogue the material that has been found. We're beginning to put that onto uh, the stray finds and uh, the one or two known dryland sites onto maps and, uh, and periodise those. And we're beginning to focus in on uh, particular areas um, where we can get, um, we can really kind of study in a, in a similar way to, I guess, inspired by Dominic Powell's and the West Hesleton, the I idea that there probably is archaeology everywhere if we look at it. So we're using quite a lot of LIDAR, we're using a lot of 
Um, we're using a lot of uh, fuse shed. Uh, we're we're um, finding sites on the ground. This is actually uh, this looks. This is one we found at the end of uh, which I should dig this year. I hope, um, which is not in the uh, was previously unknown because it's it's basically it's a very difficult uh, unless you've got light out very difficult to find these things. But that's really quite a large, probably late Neolithic or early. Bronze Age defensive rampart, but we shall see. And on the water, we're also um, we've we've basically uh, are kitting out now to be able to look um, underwater. I'll just click. I should just have a couple of nice little pictures to show you what we're doing there. Um, oops, let's <coughs> shrink that down. Um, so we're. Plane. Doesn't want to. Oh, yeah, there we are. So, so we have. Um, we, we're trying to move the bathymetry of the lake uh, base at the moment is at a ten meter, largely at a ten meter interval, and we're moving. We hope this this coming year to uh, a, a centimeter resolution. <coughs> this seems I should have preloaded this. I'm sorry about that. Um, it is worth seeing, I hope. So the idea here is to see how many more sites we may have uh, uh, that are visible um, on the lake bottom, but also to look beneath that. So we have something called a, um, a sub-bottom profiler, um, which um, looks can look up to uh, 60 metres down um, beneath, the, uh, beneath the lake base. Is that going to play if it isn't I'm gonna no it seems to not like it I'm sorry about that um, we can see them in stills anyway sorry um, so uh, that's our sub bottom profile this is the eponymous site of uh, Zay on Monse so it's where the, the most of the classic finds came from and you can see the the stakes the wooden uh, posts sticking up but also cultural layers um, going down. Um, this is a 20 meter scale on the side here, 20 meters, 40 meters, and so on. Sorry, that was kind of... So we're thinking about uh, then the dating strategies. Um, we don't have a good dendrochronological sequence because uh, the timbers are... There are a lot of technical difficulties with the size of the timbers we've got. Um, we're working <coughs> between archaeologists and paleo-environmentalists <coughs> And um, we're just beginning to put a whole series of, of C14 dates together. We haven't done uh, any uh, modelling yet. Um, we're literally, most of these ones, the ones with blue, are unpublished dates. Um, this is us, UNESCO, and, um, uh, uh, and other organisations. So we're trying to build a spine um, so that we can see the general spread of uh, lacustrine structures and there you can see uh, here we have them beginning around about three uh, three thousand uh, eight hundred cal and then come through and obviously we come into the historic period with some kinds of harbour works in dryland excavation we've um, decided just using topographic analysis like to go into things which are not known archaeological sites so this is the site of Lensing Burgstall which is a uh, is now a site, but was a small flat hay meadow in the middle of a modern uh, housing estate where we used uh, geophysics and no stray finds known from that at all, no topography, no bumps in fields, no nothing. And we were able to recover by a fairly intensive 100% um, um, sample, basically flotating absolutely everything we've turned up. Uh, material, Bavarian flint arrowheads, uh, uh, Tyrolean, um, uh, rock crystal and ceramics from the uh, the, the correct sort of period. Um, this is just a couple of kilometres away from well-known uh, lake village structures. So, uh, in a sense, to find it that close and um, begins to look uh, be, begins to be in support of anthropogenic <coughs> uh, impact scale B. And we've got short-lived deposit from uh, pits which uh, allows us to, this is probably, a, this is on wood and is probably uh, too early. Uh, these are on grains and 
um, we're getting the, the classic modern safe phase, um, and then uh, something uh, uh, rather later in the uh, in the CAM period. Um, what we do see with this is that we've got um, a very high level of erosion. By doing the soil chemistry, we know we've lost at least 70 centimetres, maybe a metre uh, off the top. So that's why we have no structures, we have no post holes, we have the rests of pits. In interpreting this sort of um, thing, because we've got so little to go on, I mean, we excavated a 50 metre long trench, but we've still just got the absolute deflated, in Schifferian terms, absolutely deflated and entransformed dregs of what was a relatively uh, significantly positioned archaeological site. It's a question, is there an early foundation? Uh, is that old wood? Or is it two phases. Are those phases punctuated? Were they there? Did they go away and did they come back again? Or is there some longer continuous development that's been eroded back that just leaves us with the spikes? And um, we're going to, we're applying dating to a lot of old excavations as well, um, choosing samples to try to uh, redate and looking also in a sense, a whole diachronic picture of what are the filters, what are the later filters that have been acting on the landscape. So we're working at the site of uh, Buchberg, which is a large, um, turning out to be a large uh, Urnfield and Hallstatt period um, uh, hill fort where we've got um, ongoing work. It's uh, one of the largest fortified sites in, in Lower Austria. Um, and again, we're, the, the problem is erosion. We've got, we've got very, very aggressive circumstances. No, we get no bone preservation, acid soils, woodland soils, very hard to do geophysics as well. Um, uh, but materials which have allowed us to uh, get a Middle Bronze Age phase and then uh, in one part of the site and then uh, a large double rampart, which is, as I say, turning out to be Urnfield. And in that, we hope to be able to get uh, some very precise dates um, on the um, on the actual construction of the of the later Bronze Age uh, rampart because we've got preserved wood we've actually got waterlogged deposit um, it, underneath the rampart although we're at 800 meters because of the the clay packing which is creating a v very wet conditions and you can see the axe the actual axe marks on these pieces we've got a number of them which is something to do with the transport of materials underwater we are uh, we're working with UNESCO uh, at, at a number of uh, different sites it's my colleague um, Jutta Leskova and Cyril Dworski with Henrik Pohl um, and um, beginning to build up a radiocarbon chronology for uh, sites like Virek uh, 2 which is um, contemporaneous pretty much with uh, with Lensing and as part of that too we're putting in a uh, a number of cores we're doing on-site cores near site cores and then lake bottom cores so the idea here is to pick up the immediate uh, anthropogenic signals from uh, site activities then to see how those fade off away from known sites and then to capture the averages um, and to to basically bring in calibrated ages into those sequences. So there's the um, overall sum for uh, the Virec data. And when we look at the um, pollen diagrams, we're doing not just the pollen, but obviously the the um, non uh, pollen pollen palynomorphs as well. Um, sh this is a covering a period of about 400 years here, in which we can see. Um, the red there, the culture plants coming in. And there's a question really about what we're looking at in terms of what the spacings are uh, at this point. You can see that we've, we, can, we, we get particular datable materials, but um, you, some of these layers may have developed very quickly and some of them may represent even one year. We, on average in Monse, we've got one centimetre per 10 years of deposition going back for nearly 16,000 years. So we're getting large inputs. And within, um, within this pollen diagram, we may be able 
to see, one might be able to argue for seasonality. One can see Urtica here or Heterohelix over here or um, uh, uh, Allium ursinum types of Bearlauch, uh, Ramsons or wild garlic, um, all of which in a sense have to be on site because they've been brought there because they have sticky pollen or the pollen is in the bud or whatever and they are food and fodder. Uh, fodder plants. So there's a question we've got about what sorts of scales are visible. Um, are we, how do we see the settlement develop and can we see the, um, the seasonal effects? In our overall core uh, from uh, Monse, which is not um, fully dated yet, and this is a low resolution picture because we've, um, uh, members of the team are still working on the critical uh, middle section, so that that between there and there is not worked through. We're seeing um, some landscape-wide events, so at around about um, 6,000 cal, although that is largely a... Uh, we've got two cores which we can match across, one in Potsdam, which has been um, C14 dated with about uh, 12 dates on it, and we're uh, about to interpolate uh, our Monse core into that. We've got a a, a landscape-wide burning event at 6,000 <coughs> Cal BC, and it's a question really, you know, we, it's been, we immediately sort of started to use the word Mesolithic fire event. Is it, is it Mesolithic? There is obviously south of the Alps of the uh, Italian coast at this time, the, the, the Neolithic um, is it something to do with a transition? You can see that the whole landscape changes after this. This is this is Fagus sylvatica. The conventional beech woodland that we see today actually hasn't had a look in before that because it hasn't survived the ice age very well. Um, and what allows it to pick up is the fact that the landscape has been opened up at that point and we're now looking to see whether that is a broader regional um, event or whether it's just if you like local to Monse but it's a large a large event nevertheless or is it a natural fire event and in fact should we even call it then an event or should we just say it's a happening um, is it anything in a in historical even though it changes it's going to change the landscape that people move into rather dramatically so to wrap things up um, from our abstract, we're interested in, you know, what's natural and what's cultural. That's the conventional way of looking at it. What's going on in terms of how, do, how are we going to match our paleo-ecological cores up with our archaeological sites and our typochronology? That is not an easy matter to solve. Um, we've clearly got people who are reacting to a lot of change. Uh, how much of the of that are they causing and how much of, they, uh, of that change are they causing intentionally and um, we've already been talking about the ontological turn and um, the, the idea that um, human beings are intentional I won't um, labour us with von Wright too much now but basically there, are, there, there is obviously a, a complex philosophy behind intentionality. Um, I will gloss over um, the, um, the philosophy of von Wright here to say that um, we have been talking with Claudio Cioffi recently about his how one applies his canonical model. We're trying to of social complexity because we're looking at a diachronic picture of a growth of industry, one of the first industrial societies, the Copper Age in Austria, and then this odd dip, and then the development of the Bronze Age, and the Hallstatt salt trade comes into the whole business. Hallstatt is just up the valley from us in the inner Salzkammergut with a product which is hugely relevant for carrying capacity for milk, uh, milk uh, production in animals, and livestock, etc., etc. Um, there's Choffi's um, idea of how uh, groups do or don't recognise a situational change, that might be an environmental change, it might be a social change, how they decide to adjust to that through collective action, which may or may not succeed, or choose to ignore it, or misapprehend it. And that leads to a variety of outcomes according to whether they've reacted or not reacted, or whether they've reacted effectively 
etc. And in some cases, that trajectory leads to political complexification and social complexification through a, an increase in collective, the capacity for collective action. But intentionality towards what? What is one acting towards? And I often think about this statement that Gordon Child made back in 1949. The environments to which societies are adjusted are worlds of ideas, collective representations that differ not only in extent and content, but also in structure. Now, I don't know whether there's a bit of dualism lurking in, in his world of ideas. I, I think it's actually quite compatible with a more Recurian type of uh, 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 idea that conscious space is not entirely within the brain is something that Recur argues, and I think I feel the, the same way. But the uh, I've been very struck working within a German environment, a German-speaking environment, with uh, um, paleo-environmentalists, but also many archaeologists, that there is a very strong sense of the objective environment, that the environment umwelt is, is, a, is an out there rather than uh, a set of things that is equally much between the ears. Um, Nicholas Luhmann has also argued that you know the inv people's environment is society, and society's environment is people in his concept of structural coupling. Um, so I'm not going to give any conclusions here um, to say that we're, we, we recognise though that having chronological resolution, if we're going to talk about events and causes uh, and effect, then we have to find a way of bridging methodologically between our archaeological reaction times, what are people doing in the water and on dry land, and what is and the very high resolution data that we're getting uh, getting out of the out of the cause. Thank you.